Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Cone's Garage. Working on the Mark II Supra again today. We are doing some of the grunt work. As you can see, a bunch of cleaning supplies and some new hoses to go on the engine. Just to give it a general light cleaning and replace any dry rotted hoses. We're not looking for any kind of Concours d'Elegance style restoration or anything like that. But just a general cleaning and to take care of things that might be showing age or, or looking weak. One known fault we have is this metal line that takes coolant from the left side of the engine to the right side of the engine, but chooses to go all the way around the back to do it, has a leak in it, so we're going to replace that completely with a line that acquired from a spare engine that looked like it was in good shape. Now is the time to do this, because this thing is not only held on with fasteners to the block, but all of these fasteners are hidden under the intake and exhaust manifolds. So this is absolutely not something you would want to be doing with the engine of the car or on the side of the road. I'm really trying to fathom why this line exists in this engine's configuration because it just takes coolant from the thermostat area, wraps around the engine, hooks up to a couple coolant lines that take coolant around a throttle body, which is kind of ridiculous in its own way, uh, and it brings it to the opposite side of the engine where the coolant outlet is. There's also the connection for the return of the heater core on this line. I guess maybe it was just the most convenient way to do it. I've certainly seen more and less elegant ways to get this done, but the issue here was corrosion. It's worth noting this car is old enough that it's possible there was still methanol-based coolant in it, and that really accelerated the corrosion on metal parts like this. Anymore, we use the glycol formulas that don't seem to corrode quite as bad, so hopefully this won't be as much of an issue, but it still may be an issue in the future. For the rest of my night, just going to dedicate to cleaning up the engine and replacing any vacuum and coolant lines that looked sketchy or were just super easy to replace or right in front of me, uh, or anything that looked like it would be really impossible to replace if it was in the engine bay. So that was the focus for the rest of this time. Maybe a little bit of prettying it up, but really that's not the idea here. We want this thing to be reliable and cruisable, not really showable. Pretty funny interaction with the parts store guy when I walked in and said, Hey, how much 3.7 millimeter vacuum line do you have? I then proceeded to buy their entire remaining stock of it, which unfortunately was only four feet. Next day, I really wanted to do the rear main seal on this because it looked like it had never been done. Unfortunately, that means we also have to do the oil pan gasket because it is a shared gasket along the bottom there. You could potentially pull this rear main seal cover off and just try to splice in, you know, enough RTV for the oil pan gasket. I didn't feel like risking it, so off comes the oil pan to be redone. Probably one of my least favorite things to do just because it's uh, kind of a pain to get oil pans to seal real well. However, Permatex has never let me down. This time I'm going to use the Right Stuff Gray. Uh, it's usually Ultra Gray RTV that I use, but I've been highly recommended to use this Right Stuff Gray that comes in like an aerosol can so you can lay really nice beads with it instead of usually with the tubes, I end up doing a smeared gasket all the way around. Uh, with this Right Stuff uh, aerosol thing, I was able to do two very nice beads all the way around the lip of the pan and do circles around the eye holes for the bolts. So it should seal really well. Of course, the reason for the season here is to do this rear main seal. The cover was pretty easy to pop off, and the gasket just pulls right out. Uh, it's like a big, you know, rubber grommet type of thing. And popped in a new one, and it comes with a new paper gasket that goes around this. Why the paper gaskets always seem to work just fine for the rear main seal, but are garbage everywhere else, I have no idea. I guess because it's always two flat machine surfaces. I, I really don't know. But the rear main seal cover goes right back on, and you can see there where it mates to the oil pan. So it actually completes that, uh, that you know, run around the engine for the oil pan. A little bit weird that it creates a bit of a gap, which is another reason that I really feel like using RTV instead of some kind of store-bought gaskets, because they just never seem to seal as well. After cleaning both surfaces on the block and the pan, and getting the RTV on there, the process of trying to get it up there without bumping against the uh, the oil feed or anything like that is always a, a daunting challenge. But then we're going to loosely bolt it up, just finger tight, 
let that casket set up for a bit, and then torque it down after that. Giving that some time to dry, Jonathan's going to move over to the tie rod ends and try to remove those. I don't personally own a ball joint fork. It would make things like this easier, but sometimes these tie rod ends go very easily. Sometimes they're a total pain in the butt. It's nice that we don't have to try and save these because we're replacing them. But our history with this car so far is that anything that has been on there for a very long time does not want to leave the car. They had things that were, you know, pressed in or have been bolted for a very long time. They have merged and become a one. Fine, make a liar out of me, why don't you, car? That's just fine. Don't worry, there's still one left. Whoa now, check your aim there, guy. If I had to go and venture a guess, I would say the driver's side has been done before and the passenger hasn't, or the passenger side of the car is the side that was in the shade wherever it sat for a long time, because the stuff seems much rustier over here. Spoilers, I'm doing this voiceover much later. And I knew that this side was a total pain in the butt and did not want to budge. That's pretty tight. What you are seeing here is a reenactment of how we totally removed this. There was no really sketchy things that nearly cost me my entire face that happened in the removal of this tie rod end. Totally. It's a new day, and... If you have children watching, shield their eyes. You might need to uh, take them out of the room because what we're about to do is remove the pilot bearing. And since I don't own the tool to pull one out, I'm going to use a method known as displacement. So we're going to use the size socket that fits in the hole of the bearing and keep filling the gap behind it with grease and then hammering that grease in hoping that the grease will eventually displace enough uh, area that it puts pressure behind the bearing, and it'll pop right out. I've done this in the past, usually with paper mache. I even used peanut butter at one point, but I've always done it with bushings. This is an actual bearing, which should be easier because it has more surface area uh, to kind of grab a hold of, but uh, we'll see. I'm going to be using grease today, so it's going to get messy. Man, just like my hair. Get a haircut, you freaking hippie. So I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't looking so good in the beginning because the socket didn't seem to be exactly the right size. I didn't have one that was a perfect fit. So grease kept slipping out around the edges of the socket and it just wasn't making any, any pressure behind that bearing. Did find a bolt that was a little bit better of a fit and ended up eventually wrapping the threads of it with masking tape, making it a very good seal inside of the bearing. Still though, not making much in the way of progress. So I'm going to combine ideas. Gonna use the paper mache in the grease. Normally, you know, I just use uh, water and newspaper, but I figured pretty much the same idea here. Should be able to crunch up little pieces of newspaper to put into the hole there. And all that's really doing is helping to displace more of the volume behind the bearing and having less area for the grease to have to spread around. Also, I think what it really did was make the grease solution a much thicker viscosity, if you will. But that really seemed to keep the grease from wanting to slip out around the bolt as I was hammering it in. Very slow progress, but I could definitely tell it was working. And then every little bit of newspaper I would put in there, a little bit more grease, and, you know, give it a good hit, and you'd see it move a millimeter or so. And just keep repeating that process. So here lies the question. I've now spent an hour hammering away at grease and making a mess doing this. Wouldn't it have been more worthwhile to drive to the parts store, rent the tool, get to my house, find that the tool was broken, go back to the parts store, get a different tool, uh, get back to my house, pull the bearing out in 30 seconds, drive back to the parts store, you know, return the tool. Eh, yeah, I think this was the right way to go. Plus, I mean, I know the first time that I saw this method used, it was removing a pilot bushing from a Nissan pickup. And uh, the first time that I saw it be used and actually work, 
it just blew my mind. I, I really wanted to know how somebody figured out that this was a valid way to remove a bushing or bearing. Uh, was it like an engineer that like, you know, figured out the, the physics behind everything? Or was it just some, you know, in their garage mechanic that was staring at it thinking, hmm, that might just work. And there it is. All gross and slimy and disgusting. But there it is. The pilot bearing is out. And it was bad. This was definitely worthwhile. It was a little a little chunky, a little grainy in its movement. And the kit came with a new one. So definitely worthwhile the time to replace it while we're here. And uh, now we get to remove the big glob of newspaper and grease that was behind it. Gives you a good visual on what was going on in there to... Uh, to cause the bearing to pop out. And now to clean up what certainly looks like a murder scene, but uh, not only clean it up because of that, but we need this to be a clean surface to make the flywheel to. And also I'm gonna take some special care and time in cleaning out the threads of where the flywheel bolts go. Not just because it's grease and it's gonna make the bolts not wanna stay in as much, but also because the same thing goes for putting in the bolts. If there's fluid in there, if there's grease, when I go to torque down those flywheel bolts, they're not going to get tight because they're compressing the grease. They're compressing a fluid. Uh, that's something that has fooled me in the past, and it will not fool me again. Tappa tappa tappa, and the new bearing goes in. That bearing, by the way, is what the input shaft of the transmission rides in. It keeps the input shaft in place from wanting to wander around uh, with the clutch disc around it. So, it's an important part that is often overlooked. In this case, it's a bearing, so it spins, and it could, you know, lose the ball bearings and stuff and really make a mess in there. In most cases, it's a bushing, like a brass bushing, that is an actual wear item, and as it wears down, it lets the input shaft move up and down too much and causes damage to the transmission. So, yeah, like I said, it's just something, if you're doing a clutch job, Go ahead and do the pilot bushing and the pilot bearing. It's a pain in the butt, but it's worthwhile. No set or guide pins on this flywheel, and I kind of had to stare at it for a moment to figure out if it had an actual direction or way that it goes onto the crank. But if you look very closely, the top two bolt holes are actually closer together than all of the other ones, which kind of surprised me since, you know, uh, if it's a six bolt pattern, you would think they would be even so that it would have an even balance. But it could be a very, very slight balancing for for crank balance. Inline sixes are pretty naturally balanced. Uh, or it could just be an orientation thing. I'm not really sure. But that's the way it needs to line up. Someone out there is going, oh my god, don't touch that freshly machined flywheel. And you're right. You really shouldn't. But I'm going to take some brake clean to this thing and clean it off before we go ahead and put the clutch together anyway. Um, this is not a clean shop. This is not a clean environment. This is, this is regular how people actually work on their cars. This is not as seen on TV stuff. <laughs> this is how stuff happens in the real world. And in the real world, I'm also going to use a little Loctite on these flywheel bolts, which is not the standard protocol. However, these flywheel bolts only get torqued down to 54 foot-pounds, which is about 50 foot-pounds less than I'm used to torquing down flywheel bolts. Kind of an interesting thing there. Uh, also an interesting thing, these flywheel bolts I am reusing. On many applications, you have to check and see if they are stretched to yield or if they are super high torque uh, flywheel bolts, you're going to want to replace them. But at 54 pounds, I'm not really worried about it. They're going to be fine. Uh, even the ones on the 240 I usually reuse, and they go down to, I believe, 90 or 95 foot-pounds, and I've never had a problem with them. But don't necessarily take my word for it. If you're new to this kind of stuff and you're doing your first clutch job and stuff like that, don't just follow the hearsay. Go to your FSM, go to the manufacturer, see what their protocol is on this stuff, and you'll feel a lot more confident in your end result. And if you still need more confidence, get the Exidy Clutch Kit. Then you get the instructions like this, it'll make you laugh, and you'll forget all about the fact you didn't use new flywheel bolts. Provided it is an alignment tool that we put into the clutch disc. Then that clutch disc can be put onto the flywheel, waiting for the pressure plate to come up and grab it. Now, the alignment tool is basically just to keep the clutch disc in the right place as we bolt down the pressure plate. Once we get that bolted down, 
and that only gets bolted down to about 20 foot-pounds. You don't want that sucker to be really, you know, cranked down very tight on there because then the clutch disc can't properly uh, be released, and those are very small bolts and they're easy to break. Uh, but once you do that, the clutch disc is in place. Honestly, this is the first time I've ever done a pressure plate using a torque wrench, and I have no idea how accurate this torque wrench actually is down to 20 foot-pounds. I, I kind of highly doubt that it is, but hey, at least I could say that I used it. And now we're ready to do a throwout bearing. A lot of times you'll get the throwout bearing and it comes already pressed onto a new housing. In this case, it is not. So unfortunately, there was a camera mishap that uh, we didn't get to see how I removed the throwout bearing. But let's just say that there is now an axle nut removing socket that permanently has a throwout bearing stuck to it. But with that out of the way, and a new bearing installed, it's ready to go inside the transmission, which is nice and neatly held in with those little clips in the previous shot. And with that all ready and good to go, it's time to bring the transmission and mate it back to the engine. The hardest part of this is getting the splines of the input shaft to the transmission lined up to the splines on the clutch, and then getting the input shaft into the new pilot bearing. Takes a lot of shimmying, uh, moving around, very awkward positioning in order to get that transmission up there. But imagine doing this, but while under a car and, you know, the engine's still in place in the engine bay. Oh man, it is a royal pain in the butt. And if I can help it, I will never do it again unless I'm like stuck at a racetrack and a car needs a transmission or something like that. There's, there's just no way I'm ever going to do a clutch or transmission job and not just pull the entire drivetrain to do it. It is such a colossal pain in the butt. But a good wiggle, 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 and it finally does go into place. Just gonna tighten down the bolts around the transmission to help pull it in all the way, but it seems like all is good. The, the fork of the clutch has a little bit more play in it than I would like, but it does grab. I'm thinking what it is is the rubber grommet that goes around the fork is actually quite worn, and that's why it seems like it has a lot of play. But I'll know as soon as I place the slave cylinder on there and the piston is extended if it's good or not. This is always kind of a nerve-wracking process for me though. There's all of these individual elements in there that all have to work. And they're all completely blind. Like you, you cannot see any of them once it's all together. And you can't test them until the engine's back in and, you know, the car is drivable. So uh, it's, it's a lot of kind of daunting stuff that we just did there that... We have no idea if it actually worked or not. But that's part of it. That's the way car modification and work like this goes. It's always a little bit of a risk, and there's never 100% certainty that things will work. And if things don't work, they're always fixable. Like, nothing is said and done. Nothing can't be fixed in the future. It's still just, uh, really, I'm just trying to make myself feel better. That's, that's all I'm doing here. But with the transmission mounted back to the engine, the starter can go back into place. Oddly enough, this starter does not bolt through the block and to the transmission. It bolts solely to the transmission. That is a new thing to me. Usually those bolts also hold the, the trans to the engine. But with that done, the clutch is done. That is 100% complete. So we're pretty much ready for the engine to be going back in. However, the car is not ready for the engine to go back in. <laughs> so. It is into the engine bay now, gonna finish out the night doing a little bit of grinding off of rust of the subframe in that area so that we can get ready to put the steering rack back in. It is, yeah, we have all the parts for that, so it is ready to go. Most of this in here is just surface rust, and all of the rust over here is caused by that coolant leak. That coolant leak has probably been going on for a very long time. I'm sure it started, you know, as a little drip, and then eventually, obviously, uh, for us, it burst completely and wouldn't even hold enough coolant to run. Nothing, a little wire wheel action and some rust reformer paint can't fix, however. But that is going to do it for this week's progress on the Mark II Supra. But we can go to the board. We can go to the board and cross off some things. That is really what I wanted to do this week. I wanted to have some things to cross off. So this time we can cross off the clutch and flywheel as well as the vacuum system. Both of those are done. They have little subsets that uh, are things that will be taken care of once we get the engine reinstalled, but those two main things are done. 
Next time we'll be doing the power steering rack and the sway bar stuff, as well as hopefully starting some welding. Do hope you enjoyed watching as always, and we will see you next time.